This is the second episode of a mini-series I dedicated to masking. This time I will be covering everything you need to know about masking in Photoshop. I will show you how to utilize pixel and vector layer masks, use clipping masks in creative ways, and walk you through complex masking workflows for tricky selections. I will demonstrate the importance of tools like the pen tool for creating professional parts and less known techniques like using the dodge and burn tools for refining pixel masks. Check out the other two videos in this series if you want to learn more about masking. The links will be added in the description below once they are published. As always, if you like the way I explain things and you want to learn more from me, make sure to check out our training platform, where you can access over 200 hours of premium courses on tools like Photoshop. Use the link in the description below to start your membership now with a 3-day free trial. Alright, so first of all, before we talk about masking, we need to understand how a selection works. Because believe it or not, that's the key of understanding how to do masking. So when I create just a normal rectangular marquee selection, this already creates a separation between the active and inactive parts. So if I use something like the brush tool and start painting, you can see already my brush strokes will only be visible within the selection. So why is this important? Because when you are creating masks, you are essentially going to hide and show details. Just like here within the selection, we can see what we are doing, but outside of the selection, we have no effect on what's happening. So I'm just going to undo this one step and we will actually create a useful selection on this image. So let's say I want to make a selection of this lady. So I'm going to go to the select menu and choose subject, which relies on the Adobe Sensei artificial intelligence built into Photoshop, which analyzes the image and tries to guess what's the subject. You can see it did a really good job in this case. So now we see it, our selection as these marching ants, which is like the default view for our masks. But if I press Q on the keyboard, that is going to switch to the quick mask view. And this is almost like a transition between a selection and a mask. You don't necessarily have to do this, but this gives you a better idea of what is going to be visible and what is going to be hidden once this selection is turned into a mask. Now, the default color for the hidden details or masked areas would be red, but I actually changed this setting to blue because I found it easier to work with most images. This is something you can do by double clicking on this icon here. That's the quick mask icon. And then you can change the color here. You can even change how much overlay you want to have on the mask areas. I just kept it at the default 50%. And once again, you toggle back and forth with the Q keyboard shortcut whenever you want to switch to this view or back to the normal selection view. And why is this view useful apart from visualizing our selection? Well, this is where masking techniques starts to come into play. Because for example, if I use my brush tool with black and white colors, I can hide and show details. So with painting with black, I can hide details that I don't need. And with white, I can reveal details. So if I just zoom a little bit closer here, I think on the shoulder, we can include a little bit more that got lost in the subject selection. So if I press X on the keyboard, I can switch to white color and I can just paint over this detail here, make sure we are not chopping off any details from the shoulder. So if I want to again remove a bit from it, I can just press X and then paint over a little bit more here on these details, something like that. So refine that edge selection. Now, of course, the hair is not perfect. For that, Photoshop has other features, which I'm going to show in a moment. But for now, all I wanted to show you is that working in the quick mask mode can help to refine your selection before you turn it into a mask. So when you want to turn it into a mask, just make sure you press Q again to go back into the normal selection view first, and then click on the Japanese flag icon here on the bottom right, that's the add layer mask option, which will turn it into a finalized layer mask. And this is a pixel mask, because we will be creating vector masks later on. For now, we created a pixel mask. 
So first of all, if you want to see your mask, how it actually looks, you can hold down the Alt or Option key and click on the mask thumbnail. That way you see how Photoshop handles these pixel masks and you can see exactly that white is used to show details and black is used to hide details. So white shows black hides. The best analogy is light itself. So wherever there is light, you can see things and whenever there's darkness, you don't see things. So white shows black hides. That's how I remember it. Now, if I want to see details here in the selection, I can zoom closer. And the reason why I call this pixel mask, or that's technically how it is called, is because it's actually using pixels. This is a very high resolution image, so I had to zoom really close to be able to see these pixels and the anti-aliasing on the edges. But if you are working with pixel masks, that's just one of the things that you have to remember, that if you are resizing these layers up and down, the quality of your mask is going to degrade, just like the image quality itself, unless you are using a smart object. So there's a lot of technical terms here I'm using. If you are not familiar with Photoshop, this might be a little bit too much, but just bear with me. So let's switch back to the normal view by Alt or Option clicking again on the mask thumbnail. And uh, let me just demonstrate this to you. So what happens if I use free transform, for example, and resize the image? Control T or Command T is the shortcut for free transform. And if you hold down Alt or Option key while resizing, it will resize to the center of the image. So once I press enter, it accepts these changes. And then if I do the same thing again, drag it up, you will see when I zoom closer that we lost a lot of the original image quality. But also if I check my pixel mask, it also lost a lot of the original details. So instead of doing this before you are resizing a layer with a pixel mask on it, you would like to wrap up both the image and the mask into a smart object. So I would right click and choose convert to smart object. And then that means we will have the original size or resolution of our high resolution image saved into this layer. And also it applies to the mask itself. So both the mask and the image quality will be preserved in the smart object. And if I need to go back and refine my mask, I can just double click on the smart object layer or the thumbnail and within it, I will be able to refine further my mask. And just like with a quick mask, if I need to go closer and show and hide details, so for example, up here, I want to start refining the edge, I can use the brush tool as long as I have the mask selected. It's important, not the image, but the mask. Because if you have the image selected and you start painting, that's obviously painting on the image itself. While if you have the mask selected and you're painting with black, just like in the quick mask view, it's going to hide details. But masking, and that's probably the most important thing to remember, is a non-destructive method, which means even if I make a mistake, like so, I can switch back to drawing with white and I can reveal these details again. So that's probably the most important aspect of working with masks, that you are never deleting any details. Now, I mentioned that with hair selection, there's a much better way of refining edges. And that is actually it's very simple. Once you have a pixel mask, you just have to double click on the thumbnail. So double clicking will take you into the select and mask workspace, which is a dedicated space for refining your selections and masks. And by the way, this is only available in more recent versions of Photoshop. So if you have an older version, you might not have this feature, but instead you will have refine mask, which is quite similar. It's just a different way to get to it. But here in this view, we have a tool which is called refine edge brush tool. And with this one, I can just paint over the edge and notice how nicely it starts to bring back all those subtle details that we are losing from the hair. So if I just paint over here as well, I don't go too close inside. I just go around the edges. And even here, we can go over it a bit. 
and there you go it's a much better result but further on we, if we feel like there's still more missing details we can paint over them but eventually obviously Photoshop will struggle to find edges if there's only just very small stray hairs floating around because it will start to include details from the background as well so you just have to be careful about how you are using this tool and of course there's lots of other options here so there's plenty of ways of previewing as well the background you can see it on black and you can even adjust the opacity so we can see it better you can see it on white background and in this case that's probably easier to spot what we are missing so maybe here we can go a little bit further away there's some hair details there as well but once I click OK all of these changes will be updated on the mask so once again if I alt click on the mask icon I can see it what we achieved and here's a cool technique that I explained in a couple of other videos and I go into much more detail on these techniques in uh, my Photoshop Masterclass and the other courses we have on our course platform if you want to check them out the link is in the description so the technique that I use for refining masks uh, especially on hair or these fine edge details which can also be called technically high frequency edges so we can use dodge and burn tools but what's important is with the burn tool you want to use the range set to shadows and with the dodge tool you want to set the range to highlights so with the burn tool I can very quickly tidy up details like these that are not important if I'm careful enough I am not losing the hair detail like here as well you can see it pretty much preserved that strand of hair but if I want to bring back a little bit more detail on these strands I can use the dodge tool so I'm using again shortcuts to switch back and forth and you can see I can tidy up fairly quickly these hazy details that we don't need and I think that's already looking much better you can get used to seeing details in this mask view or ghost view as well sometimes I call it when I teach in classrooms so when I alt click again back we can see how it looks and we can put a colored background behind it let's say white and we don't have to work in the mask view when you have something in the background you can also just use these tools like the burn and dodge tool as you can see uh, while having a background visible now of course this takes longer to refine and hair hair is one of the most complicated things to select especially when your original background is complicated and has lots of different colors in it so I don't want to go into too much depth on this because I want to cover all the different masking techniques instead so this was just an introduction to how to work with pixel masks and what a pixel mask means so remember we actually have this all within a smart object so I can go back to that by turning off this document that was open and we can already see how much better the left side is compared to the right side of the hair selection but even just selecting a person I wouldn't just rely on a pixel mask I would actually use the pixel mask only for the hair but for the body I would use a vector mask I'm going to get to that but before we go there I would like to show you another example of working with pixel masks and in this case I combined two images so we have the original image of this girl and then I placed the tigers next to her now I can't remember exactly whether she was just standing there or whether she was leaning to something but uh, I think I just figured out that it would look nicely these two images together and this is actually from our 365 days of creativity series if you want to check it out again the link is in the description below it's a completely free series to watch here on our channel uh, it's one minute video we covered each day of, for a whole year in 2018 and if you want to see the more in depth tutorials for each of those we have a 30 hours long actually more than 30 hours long course on our platform which again if you subscribe you can get access to everything for a small monthly fee all right so here we have the mask on this image with the tigers again it's a pixel mask and I started off with a subject selection and then refined it slightly 
But just like before, if I alt click on this, we can actually see the mask itself. You can see what's visible, what's hidden away. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this is always a good thing to do before you finalize an image. Sometimes you don't even notice details like this one here. I wouldn't have noticed unless I check my mask. And once I check my mask, I can use things like the brush tool to refine edges. Again, here there was something left behind from the original details. And even like here on the fur, these shouldn't be uh, transparent because anything that is not white will be see-through. So if I alt click back and forth, we can see that that's actually so it should be solid fur. So I can use the white brush tool and paint over that detail. Same goes for this part here as well. Once again, if I switch back and forth, it's hardly noticeable, only visible once we are actually in the mask view. And the same goes for the, the ear. Once again, once I paint over it, it comes back and we can see now it is completely solid. So these shouldn't be uh, see-through or transparent. And then the technique that we used in the previous example with the burn tool, I can use that here as well to tidy up the edge and look how nicely it works here. And the, that was the burn tool. And then the dodge tool I can use just to brighten up the edges a bit, switching back to the burn tool again, and then switching to the brush tool to tidy up the edge, something like that. All right. So, that is obviously a much neater edge already. And the same thing we would be able to do all around here, especially there on the right side. But I don't want to waste more time on this. I just wanted to show you that when you work with pixel masks, always remember to check your mask view and refine the edge there using the brush tool, dodge, burn, and so on and so forth. And of course, the select and mask feature as well, which is very robust and you can do a lot of more advanced techniques with that. But let's move on to a, another big category of masking techniques in Photoshop, which is called clipping masks. And first of all, I am going to show you a tool that is one of the most recent tools introduced in CC 2019. It's called the frame tool. Now, I am not a huge fan of this tool, but in a way, I'm starting to get used to it and they are improving it. And I know that it's going to become more powerful as we go along, but that's the frame tool. And I picked an image already where it will work quite nicely. So with this tool, what I can do is to draw a frame. So I just highlight this area within the frame. And similarly to InDesign, this created this placeholder for us. And if I use this image from the previous example, which I have prepared here on a separate layer, I can just use the Move tool and drag and drop it onto the placeholder and it will automatically turn this into a special type of clipping mask. So it's going to mask out the details outside of that rectangle. But similarly to before, it's completely non-destructive. So I can move the image around. I can even resize it if I wanted to and align it into that frame. So that looks a little bit better, maybe a bit further down, something like that. And if you haven't tried the frame tool yet, I highly recommend to check it out. But before we move on to our next example, I wanted to show you a quick technique here that can improve these type of compositions. So to make this more realistic, what I would do is to use these lovely drop shadows that we have here in the original photograph and select them using the selection tool. I'm just going to select them like that. By the way, whenever you are working with selections, just hold down the space bar while you are making your selections to be able to move it around and refine the position of them. Once you have your selection ready, select the background image and press Command or Control J. That will put that onto a separate layer. So that is selected uh, or isolated. Now I still have it in the original layer, but on this new layer, I'm going to use hue saturation or actually there is an even faster way. If we go to the adjustments from the image menu, there is this option called desaturate, which completely gets rid of the saturation. So it turns into grayscale. And then what I can do is to put this on top of my image. So once I have my image layer turned back on, I can put the desaturated background color on top of it. And I'm just going to switch to multiply blend mode. 
Now, this is a bit at the moment too dark, but I'm going to also use another adjustment from here in the adjustments. I just choose levels and then drag the highlight clipping closer to the histogram there. Now, if I click OK, you can see when I turn this on and off, it just creates that nice shadow on the edges that we wanted to see. So that's all I wanted to show you as, as an extra little technique here with this image. But let's move on and talk about clipping masks because the frame tool in a way is almost like a cheat. It's not really a clipping mask, but it works similarly to that or even to a vector mask to an extent. But what is a clipping mask? Now, a clipping mask can be used in a lot of different ways, but the, probably the easiest example is when you have a text layer. And in this case, it's just a single character, this big N character. I'm using the font Hevitas, which is a brilliant font. If you want to find it, it's a free font. So when I have a character and it's an editable text layer, so if I use the type tool, I can select this, I can make changes to it. But if I put an image layer on top of this, so now it completely covers it and we can see that it doesn't follow the shape of that character. But all I have to do to combine these two is to Alt or Option click between the two layers. So that line between the two layers, just click on that. And once I do that, that turns it into a clipping mask. Another way of doing this is to select the layer on top and use Command Option G or Control Alt G that also will create the clipping between the two of them. So the top layer is clipped onto the layer underneath it. So if you've seen our Illustrator masking video, there I explained that you can tell what is your clipping mask in Illustrator by looking at your layers panel and you will notice a little underline uh, below the name of that layer. The same applies here in Photoshop as well. So we get that little underline there and the layer clipped onto this mask, which is the text in this case is our mask, will be indicated with a little arrow pointing downwards. So if I alt click again between the two layers, that disappears and then it comes back. So these two little things are what you need to look out for to be able to identify where your clipping masks are. So this is obviously a very useful technique and similarly to the frame tool, we can use the selected image layer and the move tool to move it around. As you can see, I can position it within the text or I can select the text layer itself and move that around. But the coolest thing with this technique is that I can use the type tool and change this text to whatever I need. So it's still an editable text while having the clipping applied on it. Now, if you start combining clipping masks with pixel masks, you can do these cool effects where you have out of bounds details coming out. And the way I've done this, if I just turn off these other two layers, is by simply using the same image as a duplicate layer and use a pixel mask on it to highlight these few leaves that I wanted to come out from the background. So if I use Alt or Option P to click on the layer mask, you can see exactly what I've done there. And with a bit of drop shadow on them, it even has a bit of depth. Once again, this is an example from our 365 Days of Creativity course and series. So if you want to see other creative projects like this, highly recommend to check it out. So let's move on to another example. This is actually very similar to the previous one. So I won't even spend too much time on it. Once again, we have a word in this case, same font as before, a nice image on top. Let's turn this into a clipping mask, alt click between the two layers, and then again, have a bit of out of bounds effects here, which again relies on a pixel mask. So simple, but very effective technique. Again, same example as before, a combination of a clipping and a pixel mask. But let's see yet another example, which is slightly different. So here we have an image that was the original black and white photograph that I used. And I just created a separate layer to add a bit of color on the lips. And then I used a pixel mask to separate the lady with the hat from the background. But then what I wanted to do is to have this nice circle, which is like a container. So I just place that circle behind her or underneath her in the layer structure. And then I can use Alt or Option key 
to create the clipping and then have a separate layer which will only show the hat again creating the out of bound effects. So you can see if I turn off the other layers, I intentionally masked out these parts here. I could even mask out by using uh, black all of those details. So the two together works nicely and creates this final result. So without the layer on top, again, it would completely close it into the circle. But with that layer, which is not clipped onto the circle, I can create the out of bounds effect. Again, same exact example as the two previous ones that I showed you. And you can see already that with a combination of masking techniques, you can be very creative and you can come up with so many really cool effects very quickly. Now, of course, you can get even more advanced once you start using adjustment layers with clipping masks and also combining vector shapes into a clipping mask. So you can see here in this case, we have quite a lot of layers. So I'm just going to reduce the thumbnail size. That way we can see all of our layers together. A good example would be this layer here. So if I turn it off, we can see those two triangles are combined into one layer. And if I turn off the image, we can just see the triangles themselves. But also notice that I have a gradient map adjustment layer on top, which is also clipped onto those triangles which I can also turn off. So by default, these are just two black triangles on the same uh, layer. It's a vector shape layer. If I select one of these triangles and use the black arrow or more path selection tool, I can alt click and drag or option click and drag and add as many shapes within the same layer as I want. If you create a separate shape, by the way, let's just draw maybe a circle separately. You can see it ends up being on a separate layer. We can combine these two layers by selecting them and using Command or Control E. And that's going to merge them into one layer, but still allow us to select them individually. Now I'm just going to go back here. So I wanted to show you that having these two shapes on the same layer and then adding a layer on top as a clipping layer will create this effect as we've seen it before. And the cool thing about this, if I start moving this around, it moves obviously in both of those shapes. But once I add an adjustment layer, in this case, this gradient map on top, also clipped onto this group, it will be able to restrict the adjustment to our selected triangles. So it will only apply the gradient map onto that selected area. So just like clipping an image onto a text layer or shapes, you can also clip adjustment layers to any type of layers. Once again, alt click to remove the clipping, alt click again to add it back. And now that I showed you this, you probably can tell how I created this composition. Again, if you want to see the whole workflow, this is also from our 365 days of creativity series. And that's all I wanted to show you about clipping masks. So now it's time to talk about vector masks. Now we can't talk about vector masks without the pen tool. And this is one of the most crucial skills that you need to learn if you want to be good at graphic design. Because pen tool can be used for so many different things, including illustration, but also selections. I am going to show you quickly here on this example using the pen tool, a full vector mask creation. So Pen tool selected, set to path mode is how you want to start. And then just zoom close because you want to see details. And I'm going to use the starting point, maybe somewhere around here. And then click all the way to the top where it's still straight. And then zoom closer and start drawing these curves. Now, when you click and drag, you can create curves. And while drawing your curves, you can hold down the space bar to move the uh, currently selected anchor point around while you are still drawing it. So I can align it and then continue further the uh, curve and I can go up there. I can draw a straight line again. Uh, using the pen tool can be a tricky one. So I'm not going to cover how to work with the pen tool. I have a completely separate course for that if you're interested. Uh, and I'm probably going to do more videos on this in the future. But for now, we are just concentrating on masks. So if you're not familiar with this tool, you can check those out. So I'm just going to draw this very quickly and you will see a cool technique here uh, that I'm going to show you. So when you are doing this, you will eventually get to a point 
where you need to turn around your canvas. I'm just going to make sure it's nice and round there. Okay, so here I find it easier if I use the R keyboard shortcut, so R for rotate, hold it down, click and drag, and then continue drawing. So I, I, I find it easier to draw these shapes, uh, vector shapes, when we have the angle set up to be going slightly up and to the right. Because I'm right-handed, that's just the direction in which way I can draw these lines better. And I found it much faster if I do it this way. It's actually quite hard to see the edges sometimes, so I'm just being a little bit sloppy here, just so you can see quickly the end result. So that's quite a lot of details, but I'm going to try to get through it. And maybe we can even speed up this part. Let me just stop it here for a second because I just realized that there will be all of these little intricate details here on the lens at the bottom. And if I want to do this properly, I would need to go around them one by one. Now, instead of using the pen tool, in these cases, I would recommend to use the curvature tool. So instead of drawing each individual points one by one, so I could draw one bump and then the next, and I would keep drawing these slowly by one by one and it's just really hard. Instead, what I would do in these cases is to use the curvature tool with which all I have to do is to click on the corner points, so top and bottom, top and bottom, and look at that how nicely it's doing it for me. So this is definitely a huge time saver. So again, just top and the bottom points, so each of these little heels, the top of the heel and then uh, between the two heels. That's all you need to do. So this can be a huge time saver, but not only that, it can also reduce the anchor points that you are working with. And that's obviously in these cases are the most important thing as well. You don't want this vector mask to end up having so many different anchor points. So this is still time consuming and you might be wondering why am I doing this? Why am I not using a quick selection or a magic wand or something like that? Now those are the lazy selection tools. They can obviously be useful and uh, I could explain to you how to work with them, but I honestly don't recommend to work with them, especially if you're working on professional projects. Maybe you can start with one of those tools, your selections, but if you are selecting especially hard edge details like objects in most cases, like this one as well, uh, you will be able to create a much better final result by using the uh, vector mask tools like the pen tool or curvature tool. All right, we are almost at the end. So by using vector mask on hard edge selections like this, you will be able to refine the edges much faster and easier uh, compared to a pixel mask plus quick mask and all the rest of the quick selection techniques, uh, including magic wand as well is not going to produce a nice edge detail, especially when you have background colors that are very similar to the actual object's color. So I'm just going to show that quickly to you once we get to the end of this. Again, I'm just going to speed it up here because you've seen the important detail and part of this technique. Okay, so here we have our final vector mask selection and you can see how complex that bottom part was. I didn't even realize until I started doing it. So, but this is still a really good example to see the difference. So once we have our path, we can turn this into a vector mask by selecting the layer and then holding down the command or control key while clicking on the Japanese flag icon. So that's going to create a vector mask instead of a pixel mask. So let's do that. And the way you can tell that you have a vector mask is that the thumbnail will have a gray background and whatever is visible is going to be white. When you select your mask, 
and you use the direct selection tool or the path selection tools, you can actually highlight the shape or the path that you created. So that's included within your vector mask. Now this creates obviously a very nice crisp edge and it's resolution independent by the way so it's not going to lose quality because it's vector based. But if I create a new layer underneath this I'm just going to add the solid color layer. Let's just drop that down there. Maybe change this color to something that will make sure that we can see all the details so it stands out a bit more. Okay that's a very bad color combination. Something like this is a bit better. So now if I zoom closer we'll be able to tell how nice the edge detail is. So obviously I could refine this further but just by looking through the edges I can see that we've done a fairly good job even here at the bottom uh, at first attempt but wherever I spot any issues so let's just be a little bit more critical and zoom closer here if we find any parts that we would like to refine we will be able to go over these edges I'm actually quite happy with most of this maybe here I can see a bit of a mistake so I can go back to the to my mask use the direct selection tool and select details like make a marquee selection with the direct selection tool and then if I zoom closer you can see this probably better I can move them around so I can push them in a bit if I felt like there was some detail that wasn't necessary or even here if I want I can get rid of these, uh, this little bump just adjust the curve and then select that point and push it in slightly until we get a better edge detail so that although it's not 100% accurate but I think it looks already better here I can see a bit of the edge detail showing so again I use direct selection tool and just push these up by using the arrow keys you can nudge details by one pixel at a time so up and down arrows I can adjust that that looks better maybe select these push them to the left a bit that is looking better too and then here maybe we can select more of these points and just move them up a bit again I'm trying to get rid of all of those white details from the original image again here maybe we can just select that point direct selection tool and just push it in already it looks much better and then this is just a highlight here but if I want I can push it in as well slightly that point up there can be pushed in as well maybe a little bit more and then we have a much better detail so now let's compare this to a pixel mask so the sloppy and fast way of doing the selection would be to get rid of our vector mask and I'm going to turn off this other layer as well so having this layer selected I can go first let's just try the uh, subject selection that's probably the laziest option there is and it is actually going to do quite a good job but of course it will be struggling and making selections on these fine details especially when there's not enough contrast on the edges but it even struggles here on the left side so if I press Q on the keyboard shortcut that's horrible that edge detail again here on the top really bad and I wouldn't even uh, bother using the tools like the quick mask and refine the edges because it's never going to be as nice crisp and smooth as a vector mask so that's why learning the pen tool is crucial it's very important and I'm not even going to waste time on showing you the differences between the magic wand the quick selection tool and the color range because they are all going to have issues or they will be struggling with the same uh, not so nice edge details especially again when your object and the background colors are very similar because all of these automated tools rely on color differences or contrast and if there's not enough of that it's not going to be able to create good selections while with the pen tool and the vector mask you can always create an amazing selection so just so we can see how this uh, selection would end up if I create my mask you can see the end result of subject select feature and then we can see the end result of our vector mask quite a big improvement I would say
Now let me show you one more example quickly of vector masks because there's another aspect of them that I love that you can actually combine multiple parts onto the same vector mask. Why would you need that? Well, for example, here we have a periscope and then we have a different background. So I must out this object from the original white background or blue background, sorry, the sea and the sky. And now I can put whatever I want in the background, so it's completely see-through. But again, I used a vector mask because I wanted to have these nice, crisp, sharp edges. But I also wanted to have the flexibility to make changes to these edges easily. So for example, here, if I zoom closer, you can see that this point is supposed to be a bit more rounded, which is luckily something that we can easily do. By using the pen tool, I can zoom closer and add the point here and another point up there, then remove that other point and then using the Alt key, I can adjust the edges or the handle points and there we have a nice rounded corner. So this is again just a reminder that you have full, flexible, editable details that you can easily construct and refine as you go along. But what's more interesting here is that I use a lot of shapes for the vector mask. So working with the vector shapes that you have in Photoshop, some of them are actually hiding details while others are showing details. So if I select this big circle here, the, the outside circle, and I can check here on the top, it says combine shapes, while this one in the middle says subtract front shape. So these are called shape operations and it's similar to Pathfinder in Illustrator. So some parts of the vector mask will show while some parts will hide details. You can also think of them as one of them would be white in a pixel mask and another shape would be black in a pixel mask. But to better understand this, let me show you this from scratch. I'm not going to do the whole thing. Again, this is in our Photoshop Masterclass if you want to learn better this method, but I'm going to just quickly show you the most important aspect of it. So if I use a vector mask, first of all, command click on the mask icon, just creates an empty vector mask. And then I can use the shape tool, in this case, the ellipse tool set to path mode. I can also check that this is set to combine shapes. And then I can click and drag, start drawing my circle or ellipse, hold down the space bar to adjust it to the position where it needs to go. As the trickiest thing to draw circles, without the space bar, I would never be able to find where they need to go. But with this, I can very quickly align it. And there, I think it's quite good, so I can let go. So now that it's been created, I just have to make sure it's pasted into the vector mask. You can always Control C, Control V, or, or Command C and Command V to paste it into it. Now that it's in the vector mask, I can draw my next circle. So I'm going to draw this and again align it to the center part like so. All right. But because it was also set to combine shapes, it's still showing details. I actually would like this to be used for subtracting details. So if I switch to that, now we can see it removes those details in the middle. Now to be able to reveal the details in the middle, I would need to draw separate shapes for that. So in the meantime, I'm just going to keep this shape also set to combine shapes. So just so I can see what I'm doing and I'm going to continue using shapes, add one on this one here in the middle and align it again something like that. I'm not going to waste too much time on this because I guess you will get the idea now. I'm going to use the rectangle tool for these. Okay, so now we have a combination of these shapes. I can go back, select that path and switch it to subtract front shape. And that way we now have the perfect combination where we have details shown with some of these shapes and we have also parts that are hidden away. So within the same vector mask, using multiple shapes, some of them to show, some of them to hide details, you can get really complex and refined selections. And this is really where you are starting to do a very professional masking workflow where not only everything is editable, but you are also saving time by using geometric shapes wherever it's possible. 
And last but not least, there's another masking feature that we need to talk about in Photoshop, and that is the Smart Filter Mask. Whenever you create a smart object and you apply a filter on it, you will also get a mask for specifically for that filter, and that's what we call Smart Filter Mask. So in this case, the original image looked like this. So there was no motion blur or anything like that. But then I went along and created a vector mask for the car, which we have inside this smart object. So we can see the vector mask there. I've done all the work and created this nice outline. And then having it placed on top of the original background, I used on the background a motion blur but it was created on a smart object, which means that it's non-destructive. And more importantly, the motion blur I only used in the background and in the foreground, but whatever is in focus, that central part, is actually masked out. So the motion blur itself is masked out. If I shift click on this, I can hide it so you can see how it would look like if I didn't do that. Well, if I shift click again, I can show again those parts. So basically what you can do with these type of masks is to mask out effects. So same thing if I use the brush tool and start painting, black will hide the effect or filter and white will show the filter again. As simple as that. So same exact principle what you would use on a pixel mask, but in this case it is used to show or hide the filter. Photoshop is actually doing a really good job at showing you these three main categories of layer masks in the properties panel. So the filter mask, the pixel mask, and the vector mask. So you have the three main categories here and you can actually switch between them. And this is actually the three type of masks you can have on a layer. And the fourth one would be a clipping mask, but the actual layer mask we call are these that you can see here together. So would you ever need all of these different masks on the same layer? Well, it can easily happen. And I had previously projects where I had to combine them and I even had to use multiple layer masks or vector masks on the same layer. And it's good to know that if you are creating a group, so layer group, command G or control G on a layer, the group itself can have more masks on it. So I can add another mask. And in that way, if a layer is within a group, you are actually adding more masks on the same layer. So it's almost like unlimited options that you have there. Actually, I think you can create up to 10 subgroups, which means you still have a limitations, but let's not go down that route. Instead, let me show you one final example where I have a good combination of a pixel mask and a vector mask. But for this technique, I like to use two separate layers. So the same layer duplicated, one having a pixel mask, the other one having a vector mask. And this is actually the most common workflow I would use for selecting people professionally, because the body is best to be selected with a vector mask because we have nice sharp edges, so clothes normally, uh, jewelry even, and just the skin itself normally is best to be selected with a vector mask. But the hair is much better selected with a pixel mask because obviously we have all those fine details that you won't be able to select properly with the vector mask. So as you can see, I combine these two layers. We can see them one without the other one. But by combining them together, we get a really good, like best of both worlds selection. Pixel mask for soft edge selections, which is hair, fur, grass, all that type of things. And then a vector mask for the hard edge selections. Again, this is one of many examples that I cover in my Photoshop masterclass. So if you want to learn more about selections and masking and become really good at doing these things fast and efficiently and the professional way, I highly recommend to check it out. Again, we have a monthly subscription. So if you become a member, you can access all of our courses for a small monthly fee. And I hope you found this extensive tutorial on Photoshop masking techniques useful. If you want to learn all the different masking techniques in Illustrator and InDesign, go and check out the links in the description below and watch those videos for free here on YouTube. Let us know in the comment section what would you like us to cover next time on this series. Click on the link in the description or the join button to become a member if you want to work on future projects with us and see the whole design or illustration process live. Thanks a lot for watching. Like and share this video if you enjoyed it. Have fun learning guys and I will see you in the next one.